The Christmas agenda is set. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. It's time to talk. A Bangladesh garment factory disaster that shocked the world. Eight months on, what has changed? The Christmas tradition as we know it today, made not in Bethlehem, but in Germany. And helping a worthy cause is just a click away. So why the guilty conscience? Welcome to this Christmas edition of Agenda, everyone. I have invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. One of the best gifts you can give this Christmas is your online voice of support. That is the holiday tip coming from Paula Hahnemann. She is the Germany head of change.org. It claims to be the world's biggest online petition platform. We're looking forward to unwrapping that gift. Paula, good to have you on the show. Thank you. Well, he loves the German Christmas originals, such as a decorated tree and lots of lights, but the American-born Berlin local satirist Eric Hansen says a little more commercialism here would increase the Yuletide glow. You're gonna have, you're gonna have a tough sell on that one, Eric. Good to have you on the show. Thank you. Well, the retail orgy before Christmas would not be possible as we know it without the ridiculously cheap labor of thousands of people in Bangladesh's garment industry. And that brings me back to Hanan Majid. He is a Bangladeshi British filmmaker. Hanan, it's good to have you back on the show. Um, you were here last spring after that garment factory collapsed in Dhaka. I think more than a thousand people were killed. You were on a mission back then to, to document the plight of people who make basically the shirts on our backs. What did you find out? Oh, thank you for having me back first. Uh, lots of things have happened uh, since, since I was last on the show. One of the main things that's happened just recently has been the rage in the, uh, the way the rise in the minimum wage to 5,000 tackers, so that's like 73 euros, I think. Uh, so, what, but what they really wanted was 8,000 tackers, which is 100, around $100. Sorry, that was $73. Uh, well, but, I mean, is, is that a living wage? I mean, can, well, can a not, family not, live on that? Well, not really, to be, to be honest. But the problem was that, you know, they, the government could not decide on the 8,000 tackers because they actually thought the buyers that are, you know, companies like your H&M, your Primark and these guys, they thought that they would not agree to that. So they second guessed them and they, and they said, let's go for 5,000 tackers. Now, that's, that's a shame. It's, it's a victory in a sense because the wage before was 3,000 tackers mm -hmm. uh, and now it's 5,000. So they've got, you know, it's an extra 2,300, 5,300 actually is uh, in total. So they've got a bit more there to play with. But still, I don't think it's enough. Okay. I think it should be, they should, they should go to 8,000 because that's what the garment workers want. They feel that's sufficient. To, to live off, mm -hmm. you know, that's sufficient to be able to pay for their rent, to be able to save some money, to pay for their bills. Keep in mind, all of these workers are providing monies for their families who live in the villages. They're providing for their siblings to be able to get an education. And, you know, on, on what was 3,000 tackers before, that's not possible. Even on 5,000 tackers, it might be possible, but it still means those workers are still, the conditions that they're living in is not great. I mean, they're not living in good conditions. They're not making a lot of money, and yet they're supporting families with this. And they're doing all of that just so we can go and buy cheap T-shirts and, you know, shirts at Christmas time, like, like, like we've done this year. Um, is it in your mind when you go out and do your shopping, do you think about, I mean, the people basically who have suffered so that we can have presents? Well, I think one of the biggest achievements of, of those campaigns and um, with all the NGOs and organizations and the workers on the ground who are fighting for more rights, more labor rights, has been done that if now a Western consumer, I know that from myself, I know this from a lot of friends I have, if they look at the tag and see made in Cambodia or made in Bangladesh, they actually have not a blank thought in their mind, but they know exactly what this means. Mm -hmm. This means cheap labor, bad labor conditions. And do they buy? And they still buy, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know, it, it needs time in the brain to completely from a thought to your action yeah. to change it, but it's already there. The news is out there and people know by now. And yeah, I think that's the first much, step. Doesn't make much of a difference though if they still buy. What, what would you say, Eric? Yeah. 
I, I, I think it's kind of a, a, an illusion that we're, that we're changing our, our attitudes and that we're becoming more aware of anything. I think we're, it's, a, it's, a, it's the kind of thing, this awareness is the kind of things we talk about when drinking coffee or drinking beer, but when we're actually buying something, it's really not important, especially for like maybe 95% of the, of the population. The normal guy out there uh, just wants a cheap shirt. And uh, I'm not sure that he's really wrong. I'm not sure that is his responsibility. Uh, what's going on in Bangladesh? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, let's you know, let's bring some common sense to the consumer. Why should the consumer have to think about such things when they're going to buy something as simple as a T-shirt? Well, because they can do, they can pressure companies, and that is, if a company has a consumer brand and brands that's a, working for the biggest campaigning platform, I can tell you that companies want to protect their brands because that's the most important asset they have, the most valuable asset they have. And as soon as the information is out there that there's brands abusing labor rights, there's so much more target points you can tackle in campaigns. And we see this happening every day on Change.org. There's tons of campaigns from consumers being started against small retailers, big retailers, to start asking to have pr a responsible production chains. And that's a first step. I'm not saying it's the whole solution. No, I'm saying no. it's there's so much more awareness than there was eight or ten years yeah. ago. Yeah, I mean... I'll grant you that. I mean, just because of shows like what we're doing right now, people know about it. Um, and that is a good thing. Um, but these workers, you know, they have a lot to deal with. Um, it is not just the walls and the roofs of Bangladesh's garment factories that can be deadly. The latest killer, fires. Nearly 800 people have been injured in dozens of workplace fires. Most of these go unreported. And international labor advocacy groups say it is disturbing proof of the slow pace of change. Last April, the Rana Plaza building on the outskirts of the Bangladeshi capital Dhaka collapsed, burying thousands of garment industry workers under the rubble. A three-week rescue operation began. In the end, over 1,100 people lost their lives. It was the worst clothing factory incident in history in a country that regularly sees deadly industrial accidents. The collapse sparked mass worker protests. The big fashion chains that purchase the mass-produced clothing have been wary about accepting responsibility. Victims of the disaster have so far received little compensation. Several months after the accident, garment industry unions have managed to wrangle a new monthly minimum wage and to prepare a new accord on factory safety, which some major chains, including Walmart in the US, have refused to sign. So has there been any real progress on conditions in the garment industry in Bangladesh? Or is everything still just business as usual? Yeah, Anand, do the workers in Bangladesh, do they now feel that the world knows what they're dealing with every day? No, they, definitely they do because of the coverage the Rana Plaza disaster got, you know, something we've not seen anything as huge as that. But it was strong it, what you were saying about the fires. You know, the fires, there's one a week at the moment. It's gone so bad, you know, and 80% of them, of these fires are just like electrical cuts, you know. Just bad wiring, just right? Just very bad wiring. And because of that, you're getting, you're getting these huge fires. And now this is like, this is a big killer as well. You know, not only is there the, the building collapse, but just, you know, you, like you said yourself, 800 people have died. And the, the other big problem with that is, is that none of these brands are actually owning up to this. They're not handing out the compensation. So like these people who are getting injured and they're not able to work after that, they're not getting any compensation. Walmart's not giving them compensation. And neither are Neither are some, not, any Let's of the talk about brands. Walmart, these, these big um, chains. I mean, they really have gotten an easy ride yeah. in the last eight months. I mean, I, there really hasn't been a lot of bad press for Walmart, despite the fact that they refuse to sign any type of binding agreement. Exactly. They're very bullish, I think. They're very bullish in this, uh, how, they, how they've been behaving with uh, since the Rana Plaza, since the Tazreen fire as well, and since the other little fires that are happening. You know, they're, they, they're, not, willing to, they're not willing to own up to that. But what's the leverage they've got? Because why, couldn't the government of Bangladesh say, you guys either sign on or you can't do business here? Well, this is the thing, you know, and that's what I think the Bangladeshi government's got to be. They, they themselves have got to be a bit bullish as well because they've got to realize that, well, hold on, Walmart are here for a reason because our workers are able to make these garments. They make them very quick. They're efficient. 
So they should, they should think, well, actually, we don't want our workers, our workforce, to be dying making these clothes. You know, we've got to look at this workforce and protect this yeah, but workforce. But Walmart's there because these workers are cheap. That's, I mean, let's yeah. be honest about this. Is it possible? I mean, you know the area. Could Walmart um, pack up and say, OK, we're going over to another country because those people are even cheaper? They'll have the same problems, though. Don't you think that even if they went somewhere else, you know, what's going to, where are they going to go? You know, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, where are they going to go? And it's just going to be, they're going to have the same, same types of problems. But if it's that obvious, a, then why aren't the politicians in Bangladesh using I, the leverage they have? Well, I think, I think now, because since the Rana Plaza and since there's been so much pressure on the Bangladeshi government, you've started to see changes happening there. There are more health and safety checks. Teams have been set up. I was talking to the leader of the National Garments Workers Federation just before I came here, actually, to, talk, to, give, to give me an update on what's happening. And he was saying, actually, the government, they have started to do things. One of the other things that you can say that the government also has also done, which the brands didn't do, was it was they actually, they'd, not with the compensation, they actually... They started to hand out compensation to the families, but they also get, they also paid for the funeral services. They also paid for the injured. Now the brands, huh? Oh, that's cynical to pay for the funeral yeah, services. Yeah, but you, you know. But, but I mean, it's you know, still. It's, well, I mean, still you know, it's something. What, 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 you, yeah. what you need to look at is is that. Well, hold on. The the people who are the culprits in this, yeah. the brands, they've not done that. You know. Right. And like, it, what it should be, it should be the government plus the brands. Do it doing this type of thing, not just them, them on their own. Well, the government own. workers, just, I mean, they, they can't rely on the government to be an advocate for them, right? I yeah. mean, who's protecting the, the workers besides people like you? It's, it's unions. The unions are very strong there. And one of the other things that's happened since the Rana Plaza is become easier to form unions, which mm -hmm. is a very positive step, is that, you know, these, these workers can feel as though they've got somewhere to go, you know, if, if, if they're not getting paid on time, if they feel as though they're in danger, they've got someone you to go to. You help understand that. I mean, because, uh, you know, here, here in Europe, um, when you think about having strong unions, um, you're not going to have people working in any place where you've got bad wiring, yeah. where fires are starting. So, how, I mean, you know, how to square that circle for me. How can you have strong unions and a dangerous it's, workplace? It's still in its infancy as well. Remember, you know, keep in mind in, you know, in Europe and the Americas, unions have been around for a long time. Unions in Bangladesh only started in something like the 80s, 90s, you know, mm. and now unions are being formed just recently because of their government has made it easier. So we can't expect everything to just happen with a click of a finger. Yeah, what about help from European unions? I mean, are you seeing any of there, that? There is. I, I remember we went uh, just a few years ago and uh, we, had, we had like a shop steward from uh, Unison, actually yeah. a big union in the UK, who came with us. Those links are there. The NGWF, you know, this is one of the unions that I work a lot with. Yeah. They've been working with unions here. Unions have been bringing, bringing uh, you know, their members over to come here to talk to, you know, its members in the UK. So there is that connection. And that's, there's, you know, the, it's the same with uh, Germany and Holland, for example, and the States. So there are, you know, uh, unions here who are working with unions over there. To be able to what about political <laughs> pressure coming from Europe? I know the there EU is, is threatening. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. There is political pressure coming from coming from the states as well. There's political pressure coming from London as well, uh, the UK. So, you know, these things, these types of things are happening as well. But I think one of the main things is, is that it's time that the brands actually stood up and look at look at what they're doing. You know, it's good that I think through things like Change.org, you are starting to see that. The you know your ordinary member of the public they want the brands to know that we know what's going on and we want to say something even if it is just press click and I'm going to sign a petition via that then let it just be that or if it's going outside gap and doing a protest let it be that you know mm -hmm. but I think you know now there's a generation here who who want the brands to know that we know what's going on and it's time that you guys start to look at the way that you're behaving because it's not like we're in this 80s or something like that mm -hmm. or you know uh, where you, they could do whatever they want in places like Cambodia or Thailand making trends. Right, I mean there is you more know, transparency yeah, but still at the, end, at the end of the time. day people want a cheap t-shirt period. <clears throat> Oh. Yeah, but I think th th there will be at one point uh, production chains that are being looked over. I have a quick question. Do you think, like it took decades in the last century in the Western industrialization to improve workers' lives, mm -hmm. rights. Do you think the connectivity of the world will kind of speed up that process in countries where industrialization is just starting? I mean, if you compare it, it's the same patterns, yeah. right? We had exploitation you, in Germany, you in mean Great like Britain. It's a leapfrog yeah. in, in developments. Can you see that? Because I'm not an expert on that issue, I, but can you see that there's a fast track for the 
those countries I, I, to improve? I, 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 start, I, I am starting to see a fast track at the moment, especially with, uh, for example, we've been talking about the minimum wage. Now, yeah. for Bangladeshis, ordinary Bangladeshi garment workers, that's a big deal. That's a big issue. They've been, you know, uh, not that long ago, they closed 400 factories so that they could go out and protest about this. So it's a big issue. And when I was there in 2010 making a documentary, they were protesting then. and and the minimum wage did get risen. And prior to that, they had to wait many years. Mm -hmm. So now it's only been three years mm -hmm. and it's been risen again. And I can imagine that is, that's going to continue to rise because they, they can see that the, the your workers are at a point, yep, yeah, they yeah. can put pressure on these brands, on these factories, yeah. on the government to make changes. So well, the economics, is too, is, is on the workers' side. I mean, the, the, the latest numbers that, um, that we've been reporting um, is that by the year 2020, mm -hmm. it's not that long away, um, the average um, worker, middle-class worker in China mm -hmm. will earn the same as the middle-class worker in the United States earns, mm -hmm. right? So they're going to be parity there, right? It's not that much. Um, well, still, I mean, and, and you know you've got China there is this is this huge this this huge power in Asia with influence so it's going to be harder for countries like Bangladesh to tell their workers you know you have to work for peanuts mm -hmm. so economics you could argue is on their side mm -hmm. um, but we're being really optimistic here you know it's Christmas yeah. but we you know be, we, yeah. we want we want to be optimistic here but um, at the end of the day the responsibility for the consumer. I, I mean, sometimes I, I feel like there's a little bit of flower children, you know, flower child music playing in our heads when we think that when people go shopping for clothes that they're really going to be thinking about, you know, the plight of the seamstress mm. and not thinking about, you know, the, the width of their waist. I mean, isn't that realistic? Well, there is a truth to that statement, and I think it, it probably there's a likeness that we, I mean, human beings have that, ki that kind of, uh, how do you say, trägheit, like uh, leggers. Lethargy. Lethargy. Oh, they're lethargy. And it takes really yeah. long to change directions. But again, I mean, what's the point of not being positive uh, to, to try to change things? Yeah, yeah I, I think, but I, I think the problem is also with almost this generation or even the, mm -hmm. the start of this movement of trying to change the, the actions of companies since the 70s, it's kind of an illusion. It's kind of, we're doing it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. The people who have changed, who got the, the, the minimum wage in, in Bangladesh were the people who went out on the streets yeah, exactly. and started throwing things at their government, at their politicians. It's not some guy sitting at home clicking on a link. No, I, I think, I think we imagine that we're doing all these wonderful things, that we're very aware of politics mm -hmm. and what's going on in the world, but in fact, all we really want to do is buy those, those cheap clothes. And we're not really, it's almost like a hobby. And we're not really wrong, doing anything. Right, but there's nothing wrong, I mean, too, uh, there's, there's nothing, wrong, there's with, nothing wrong no. with wanting to be a carefree shopper. No, and something is always better than nothing. Right. I mean, you, I mean it's all, it's what you're both doing is good, but we're not live. This is not paradise, and, and the human being is not going to change uh, from what he was, you know, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. He's still a guy who's looking out for his own good, for his own enjoyment. It's he is his own priority. Yeah. Before we move on, your work. Where does it go from here? Well, we've got a few projects coming out. Uh, me and Richard York, who I direct films with, we've got a documentary coming out called Masse Bat. You just saw a clip from right. it. That's about child labor, actually. And part of it is actually set in a garments factory, and that's why you saw those clips. And then we aim to do another documentary on the Rana Plaza disaster as well, to give, it, to give people an update on what's happening, to look at uh, some of the families that have been affected by it, and to actually look at the unions who are actually going out there on the street trying to get justice for those victims who have not received anything yet because I think that's a, that's one of the biggest things is that these young women who are breadwinners of their families are not breadwinners anymore and now other members of their families, younger siblings are having to go out there and work and now I think the brands really need to be doing the right thing and I think that's when people like change.org do come in because from the if you're based in Germany if you're based in the UK US or whatever that's one of the things that you can do I talked to the the leader of the union in Bangladesh and I asked him what do you think you know, people in places like England and, the, and you know, Germany or wherever can, can do. And that's what he says, you just need to put some pressure on the brands. No one's saying boycott or anything like that, but do put some pressure, let them know what's okay. happening. Well, good. And plus, you know, your work, obviously, you know, you're doing a lot for the, uh, the people in Bangladesh. All right, from one troubling retail reality to another. Have you heard of Black Friday? 
Now, that is the name given to the day after the Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S. It has become a national event. Stores open at midnight and offer big sales to jumpstart the Christmas holiday shopping season. Now, the, the images this year were disturbing. Masses of people pushing their way to get into stores, trampling each other, hitting, cursing, sometimes stabbing. Well, you won't catch me near that craziness, but I do ask myself, where is the connection between the Christmas story of baby Jesus and mobs of consumers shedding any hint of intelligent life just to get a bargain? Christmas, a time of lights here in Northern Europe. The holiday means many different things to many different people. Some see it as a time to stop and ponder, a time to help others, a time to give. A time for family and loved ones. But there's another side to the holiday as well. As the big day approaches, the gift buying season begins. Christmas is very big for the retail business. The buying frenzy won't stop until December 26th. And everywhere there are rituals. Even Bethlehem has a tree nowadays. Many Christmas customs have their roots in Germany, and the holiday is no longer just for Christians. So what's the real message of modern Christmas? That's a great question for you to answer, Eric. <laughs> um, I think we forgot or have completely forgotten that Christmas is, it has two elements. One is, you know, celebrating the birth of Christ, and that was originally on, on or uh, was often celebrated on the 24th, but the other is uh, a saint day. It's the birthday of Saint Nicholas, who was a real saint in the, I think, the fourth century, or the fifth century, in what we now know as Turkey. Uh, and he really went around, he was a bishop, and he really went around giving gifts to people. If there was a young girl from a poor family who could not marry because she didn't have a dowry, he gave her gifts, money, usually. Uh, and though, so that he could, the girl could find a husband. Um, and this, this, this celebration of a giver, of a selfless giving, um, was imported in, I think, the 10th century to uh, uh, Germany, and then from here it was imported to other places. Well, that's a headline right there. So the Germans took a Turkish man giving that's right. money to single yeah. women and turned it that's into Christmas. That's right. This was before, you know, under today's laws he would be in jail, of course. Exactly. But, uh, but and, then, and then under Luther, uh, Luther, of course, banned Saint Days because it was a Catholic holiday. And so, but because he couldn't get rid of the, the gift of the, the tradition of giving, he moved Saint Nicholas to Christmas. He combined Christmas and Saint Nicholas. Right. And that's why we're selling now, we're, we're celebrating now on the 24th, uh, two, actually two things, uh, the birth of Christ or Christianity and giving. And I think, and this, all this buying, you got to remember when people go out there and go crazy buying things, they're buying things usually for other people. And I think that's even though it's crazy and nuts and it's overblown and too expensive, um, it's still a good thing in general. We're still giving something to someone else. I think that's good. I mean, I, I'll agree with you. It's good to give, um, but I guess it's how you give too, right? And what you give. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, I think I think if 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 I'm a guy and I need a you know I need money to go to college, you know, and someone someone gives me that money uh, for, out of ulterior motives because he wants to, you know, everyone to know that he's a great guy. I still have the money and I can still go to college. I don't care about his ulterior motives. Mm. I mean, the giving is still as a as a value in itself is still there. I don't like the guy who gives you know money for ulterior motives, but I, I like his money. Do you guys agree with this? I think that the giving part of Christmas is actually beautiful. Isn't there also the three kings that also gave something to be? Isn't that yeah. also engraved in that tradition? Yes. So always that we something three different. Kings. Yeah, but that was I. I believe if I'm not, I, I may be incorrect there, but it was that was after the, was. the merging of the two traditions. Okay. I believe. Understood. But so at the giving part, I would never criticize. I think it's a, actually a beautiful thing, and everyone knows how nice it is to give. And if someone else unwraps a present, and they're happy about what they gotten. But obviously there's a frenzy, in like a shopping frenzy that's been stimulated by companies and brands. And now we recently had uh, Halloween in Germany, which was never there. And all of a sudden people start to buy Halloween stuff. And that wasn't there before. No, you, you don't like that? Well, I do like the tradition of Halloween. And I like the trick-or-treating, but it's just, it feels as if- You're pressured. 
your pressure to consume and for if you are not aware of how much you're pressured to consume by all the advertising surrounding you, it might be quite difficult to be aware of what you're actually doing and that you're constantly buying things that you might not need. So when I was a little girl, I grew up in Eastern Germany and I grew up in a world and I don't know how many actually did this by now without any advertising. Just think about this for one moment, going down a street and you have no advertising messages around you and that is a, actually was a quite interesting I think like it is world. now in North Korea I mean I, I just saw a okay. photo expose from um, Pyongyang and the uh, streets there immaculate no advertising mm -hmm. um, not a lot of cars and it does make you have a completely different um, relationship with things around you um, but I don't know if that's necessarily a better Way. Well, I wouldn't l rather live in North Korea than compared to having advertising in the Western world. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But, I mean, but the pressure is no. I is there. Yeah, I mean, um, and, it's, and it's, it's on everyone. I mean, even I mean, how Christian is Christmas today? I don't think it's. It's just it's just specific to Christians. Really, Christmas. I come from a Muslim Muslim uh, background, and within our families, people celebrate Christmas. You'll see the city, my hometown, uh, which is Bradford in Yorkshire. There's people, you know, Asian families still celebrate Christmas. I think everybody gets caught up in it because of you're bombarded with adverts and things like this. Exactly. Where just 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 like you're saying, like on TV and things like this. I I agree with everyone here that giving is is good, but I think. I think one of the things I was reading a statistic that in the, in the States, more than 50% spend more than they wanted to spend, mm -hmm. meaning they get into debt yeah. right. because of Christmas, yeah. because they're forced to consume, they're forced, they see sales, or they see this, got to buy th this thing for my cousin, they got to buy this thing for my kid. And I think if I would say anything to, uh, you know, people who are out there shopping and, you know, just buy within your means, really, mm -hmm. don't get into debt. Also think about the environment as well. Do we need all these things? You know, and if you are going to buy something, maybe look at some of the old things that you've got and start giving them away to charity or, or something like this. So you're not just flabbergasted with just needless things in your house. That's a very, it's a very Protestant attitude that you both have. As Muslim, you're very, actually very Protestant, mm -hmm. I got to say. Do you have yeah. a Christmas tree? Yeah. Uh, not at the moment. I bet you will I'm next year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this, this thing of not getting into debt, um, not spending too much, and not going overboard, being being uh, small and trying to hold yourself back. It's it's you know it's part of our, our our Western culture. It's part of our Protestant culture, but it isn't actually everything. It's 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 meant to be everything. It's not actually. It doesn't make us happier to spend less or to save more money. Um, and it doesn't help the, the economy either. The economy is based on debts, on personal debt and on state debt. But do you debt. think people feel and better when they go into debt and when the bill comes in January and... I no, mean, but they don't feel worse if they don't go into debt. No. I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's just, uh, it's your grandmother saying, don't spend the money you don't have, be sure to spend up, don't go to the bank, don't buy that car until you have the money in the bank to buy the car. And grandma was not an economist. She wasn't very good in eco economy. Um, but Angela Merkel... Yes, she's, and she's she's very much like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And she's a German chancellor. And also in uh, England, they're using what is called austerity, austerity. and that's this pro this uh, this Protestant uh, tradition. Unfortunately, it's not working. Greece Greece is still suffering. England is still suffering. Um, in in America, Barack Obama did the exact opposite. He went into debt, right. way into debt, yeah. and it's very slowly. It is working. Um, you could argue that that's a that's an illusion that 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 it's it's not true. It's every you can you can argue either way. But I, the idea that the idea that debt is bad and that consumerism is bad is is something that I I don't I don't really agree with. But it. I'm, I, I'm suspicious. You know, that. we could you know that's a different show. But why does it have to be associated with with Christmas? Um, why do you have to have this frenzy? I mean, why can't you be happy? giving your time to people you care about. Because we and, and giving, time because we're busy shopping. Yeah, we're, exactly, because we're busy shopping. I mean, you know, every, you know you, what we're all saying here is very nice, but um, a good dose of common sense, I think, mm -hmm. needs to be put on the table. And people just should say, I'm not going to do what everyone else is going to do. What's I, so I have about a feeling, that? I have a feeling that this is like, like white man Western consumer guilt. It's we are who we are. We're consumers, all of us here. We're, we buy and buy and buy. And everything that we do is based on buying. If, if you, I want to watch your film, I have to watch on the internet. That means I have to have a computer or an iPad. Same with you. If I want to get involved and save the world, 
I have to do it on an iPad or mm -hmm. something. So I have to bind by. And we look at ourselves, what we're doing, we realize what we're doing, and then we think, is this good or bad? Which is a good, a good question to ask, but I think it's not automatically bad. We're telling ourselves that it's bad so that we have a feeling, oh, I'm, I'm better than I really am. But, but it's buying, not, we're just no, consumers. Buying That's is actually are. not bad, and humans will always buy, meaning they will always allocate. I mean, we've always done that. If we had the power to get more grain, we stored more grain. That's deep rooted inside that you want to allocate basically wealth, you want to allocate security, meaning more food and stuff. So buying is not bad. What is bad is the way it has been done in our world. It's being done on the, on the, basically on the back of the planet and of the resources. So the way we consume is basically destroying our resources where we live. And that's the problem. Well, that's, so, that's, yeah. I mean, I mean that's, a, that's a story every day. Um, but getting back to Christmas, did everyone stay in their budget for Christmas presents this year? I did. I stayed in my budget. Yeah? What about you, Mr. Spending <laughs> Lover? I, I, I've kind of, I've kind of uh, it, 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 uh, uh, developed for myself a, a reputation of being Mr. Scrooge. And oh, I've, I've, re really? I've, yes, I've, I've managed not to. No one expects to get presents from me at all, which is great. And which here is you great. are telling us we need to you know, burn our credit cards. Well, first of all, I love the show. I love watching everyone go, going crazy on Christmas. And secondly, I like living in an economy that works. It works. The economy works. In Germany, okay. you know, this is a rich country, and that's based on people buying. Exactly. So, All right. Well, know. that takes us then to our next um, topic. So how can you observe the true meaning of Christmas in this turbo-thrust commercial society? Well, you could get involved with a project or a group that's dedicated to giving back to society. Now, that requires time and effort. Or you could go online and click your favorite petition, and ho, 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 you've remembered the reason for the season. Well, it's not that simple. Perhaps it's too simple. Critics of online activism say the era of click and sign has created a class of would-be do-gooders who don't do much at all. These days, if you want to attract attention to a cause you believe in, e-activism is the quickest way to get the word out. You can reach millions quickly, if the campaign has the right emotional appeal. Some online activist websites bombard subscribers with calls for support. Others push you to sign online petitions. Getting involved is just a click or two away. The internet is a powerful tool for helping activists coordinate their actions and communicate them to the world. But do we really always understand the issues we sign up for? Critics say clicktivism is mainly about allowing people to feel good about themselves while doing very little. So, what you're offering is the slackards version of doing good in society. That's a very interesting way of putting it, um, and I disagree with you. I can tell you why. So the uh, term of selectivism, meaning to slack, so to kind of be in the sofa, being lazy, and to be an activist, derives from a time where I must say online campaigning was just in baby feet, like it was just on the verge. And most petitions ranged around issues such as stop hunger in Africa forever, stop climate change now, and people would sign, but obviously no one really thought, oh my God, I'm going to make a difference here right now. Um, and as things get better, they evolve. And online campaigning now has developed into a much, much more decentralized, hyper-localized version of what it used to be. So now think of citizen engagement and participation merely being organized online by everyone who has kind of an issue they care about or they want to change something. So if, if I sign a petition to ask my mayor to have more street uh, cycle, how do you say, cycle lanes, mm -hmm. um, that is actually something I can achieve with other citizens together. That is not something that is far away, that is climate change, that is extremely complex, but I can do something within my community, uh, in my local surroundings. And that's the idea of a change.org, that providing tools for every citizen on the planet for free so that they can change the issues they care about. Stop like going away from the meter changing the world and wanting to do all the better, but introducing the idea of the seven billion solutions, as I many mean, as they're human beings. It, it, it's, I mean, it sounds good, yeah. um, but what it also sounds like is some clever people will put their petitions up there, they know how to sell, they know how to write, mm -hmm. and they'll 
just wait for all of these couch potatoes to say, oh, that's a good idea, because you can click and send money, mm. and you don't have to do anything. And they're going to make a killing on people's laziness yeah, well, without the, any accountability. Yeah, well, what we see on Change.org is every day people having winning their victories with the support of others. So, I mean, you can have the thesis or you can just look at the reality and the numbers. What's the, yeah, tell me, uh, give, give me an yeah. example of how Change.org has changed the world in a positive way okay. that we can yeah, recognize. Yeah, super simple. So, uh, you know midwives. The profession of midwives is in danger, especially in Germany, because midwives have to pay so high insurance um, to be protected. No that their, that their wage per hour is going down to minimum. So the profession is dying out. Um, for years and years and years now, people have tried to save that. People have lobbied the government to help midwives to come up with a structure that will ma make their work valuable again. Nothing happened. So here comes this woman. She's a mother of two, both helped with midwives, her children. Um, and she starts a petition on change.org. So what, what you should never forget, a petition on change.org um, is not something that only takes place online, but it's an, it's an issue in the real world. There's a real petition starter caring for it. There's a real decision maker who can make a difference. And there's real people supporting her. So this woman got the support of 150,000 mothers and fathers around Germany. And they lobbied the biggest two parties in Germany, CDU and SPD to put the saving of the midwives profession in the coalition treaty. Oh, and for they the new won. government. For the new government. And they won. So change.org has actually given content to the grand coalition that's going, that's leading Germany. Not change.org. Change doesn't run any campaigns. It's been Anke Bastrop from the small town of Schwerin in Germany who has run this campaign by her own. I but she provided the, the forum, correct? We provided the tools, yes. Yeah. So we provide the platform and people do their same. Let me give you another example uh, of Did a woman. Did you make any money though? So, Does Change.org make any money? Yeah, we, we finance ourselves because the tools are for free for everyone. So basically, I have to be paid for my work to support people. So, so, running so how are you Germany. being paid? I mean, how are you making money? So it's really easy. Um, you come to Change.org and sign a petition, let's say, in human rights issues. So it might be that you then see a small advertisement after signing a petition of, for it, say, UNICEF. And UNICEF will ask you to uh, click their sponsored petition. And if you connect to UNICEF then and agree to, for instance, sign up to their newsletter, we will be getting paid a small amount of money. It's called uh, cost per lead acquisition. Okay. And we basically connect you to UNICEF or WWF or Greenpeace or Oxfam, thousands of organizations so that's just worldwide. So that's creating networks. And yeah. you've, you've got organizations with deep pockets that are paying you for doing you know, the networking for well, them. Well, yeah, deep pockets. They well, have compared. money. Compared to us, they have much more money. Um, but obviously, compared to govern governments and corporations, they don't. But what's interesting here is that we believe that online petitions or online actions done by the citizens, they can change things. But obviously, you always need incremental change. You need organizations who work on a long time basis on issues to make sure it's not a one off spliff to change something. Over there. So, what we do is we connect people who are having signed that they want to be involved, and that's 50 million now worldwide. So we're growing by uh, 3 million users every month. It's 50 million now, it's 1.5 million in Germany. And we connect them to the organizations who then do the longer term involvement. Okay. That's the idea. This sounds good. Is everyone feeling better? I think uh, one of the positive things that I said, how I came across Change.org was the International Labour Rights Forum mm -hmm. and a war on one. And this is, of course, you know, it's about garments. So that's why, how I got it, I looked at it. And they, after the Rana Plaza, they did a big uh, petition uh, to, to encourage brands to sign up to the Fire and Building Safety Agreement. And I think they got over 100,000 signatories. And, and it did put pressure on uh, brands uh, joining the Fire and Building Safety Agreement, Arcadia Group joined it, and so that's one of the positive things. But like you said, it's not. It comes from a place where War on One and the International Labour Rights Forum, they've been campaigning on these types of things for many, many yeah. years. Yeah. So it isn't just you know you just click and you sign it. It's actually those guys have been doing something about this. They've been doing protests. They've been doing rallies. They've been going outside gap so protesting there is, things. There is it's this not leg just. Work that goes I into think it. when it is being slack is if you just sign it and you don't do anything else. Yeah. That's how I traditionally, you know, when I used to go on protests and yeah. things, you would actually go out there, you'd go out yeah. on the street, you'd sign petitions and things mm -hmm. like that, physically sign petitions. Right. I don't think it's, if you're just... The, one, the critics I, say that that's yeah. what's lacking now. Yeah, you'd, it needs to be a combination of 
all three things say where you actually you take a huge interest in what you're signing. Right. So if it is the midwifery thing, you you look more into it. Yeah. I, I, but I think that's what's happening here. I think I think even if you if if you had the the the, the hebama thing, the mm -hmm. midwife, midwife. Uh, petition, you would not just uh, sign. That's only yeah. the first action. Well, well no, but I'm thinking I'm thinking probably this mm -hmm. got into the papers too, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you need media to okay. put pressure on. So it went media. to the media, and then yeah. for the media, it went to the to the to the to the politicians. Yeah. Well, but we had that before. Yeah. Uh, the internet in the 70s you would you would get someone uh, you have a little organization you go to the media mm -hmm. and the media goes to the politician yeah. so it's the same thing it's the same thing but it's much easier enough for you and me or for people who have no access to power that, whatsoever to start to create a movement that's a problem that the, the 150,000 people who clicked on that mm -hmm. petition mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's nice, but they didn't actually do anything. They have no, the feeling that they that's did something. It looks like this from the outside. Did it? Are, are these guys? You know, yeah. the, 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 the journalists yeah. who then who took it and, and went yeah. with it. Those are the guys who do something. Yeah. I would I, mean, I would strongly disagree here because I think it's coming it's coming together. It's those who work. It's the journalists. It's the informed public. And we have yeah. reactivation rates within one campaign from 50 to 70 percent. So most people never just sign. They will then what have is, what a, is a reactivation. Rate? So a reactivation would be they have a Facebook demo. They have a phone in demo. Mm -hmm. They okay, have okay, real okay. demonstrations they, they do, on the street. Oh yeah. But what about what about the engagement. opportunity cost of being on change.org? Um, does this all this clicking at home, which is nice and comfortable, does it prevent people from going out and actually helping homeless people? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the spirit of Christmas, right? You should mm -hmm. be, you know, you're doing something that gets you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. You're not doing that when you're sitting with your laptop in your lap. Well, that's easy to answer, actually. So uh, our numbers show and also research, for instance, from the Georgetown University shows that those who sign pe online petitions today will be the petition starters tomorrow, meaning will be the ones who start then their own campaigns. Uh, those who sign online petition are twice as likely as the traditional counterpart donors to actually be more engaged and take an offline action after they've taken an online action. We call this the, the cycle of engagement or the ladder of engagement. Yeah. You start small and then it's about, it's the art of campaigning to pull people in and it really, we can see, if you signed 10 petitions on change.org, the likeliness that then you will start your own campaign because you've gotten how it works. You've gotten how you rally for support is increasing immensely, and that's the idea. Okay, we're running out of time. Um, it is Christmas. Um, did, did you all get what you wished for? Yes or no? I did, yes. I got time with my family, amazing food. Um, yeah, so. Yes, I Scrooge? Yes, I, I did. I did, without giving much, I did actually get what I uh, wished for. Okay, and yes, I did. I got uh, some nice presents and uh, some nice food. Okay, good. That's good. Well, I did as well, and that's going to wrap up this Christmas edition of Agenda with Brent Goff. Remember, you can contact me on Facebook. You can tweet me as well at Brent Goff TV. And if you want to watch the show again, go to DW's website, or you can watch us on YouTube. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda for the final time in 2013. Merry Christmas, everyone.